Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Open World. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing Emily Scahill, head of client success and key member of the Skill Search Games team. With a background in HR wizardry and people charm, she's not just a pro at ensuring, at ensuring client happiness, she's also a founding member of the Skill Search Dungeons and Dragons Society, and more recently, a brainiac on the Skill Search quiz team. Emily is the go-to guru for client satisfaction, keeping their game studio partners grinning from ear to ear throughout their relationship. Emily, thank you so much for joining us, and thank you, my dear co-hosts as well. No problem at all. It's lovely to be hey, here. Hey, everyone. Thank you, uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome. Thank so you, Emily. Let, let's jump right into the questions. So. I'd first like to know um, if you could describe your role in the recruitment process within the video game industry and if it differs somehow from other industries. You take it from wherever you want the question. The floor is all yours. <laughs> yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so, uh, myself and the wider team at Skill Search partner with video game studios and also interactive studios. Um, to help them find the the best uh, candidates for their for their positions, who will ultimately be happy there long term with the culture um, and everything else that that comes with them um, being in a job, um, whether that's you know experience, skills, etc. Um, the um, we also kind of we really partner with studios, so we provide lots of training and um, advice on processes and EDI and uh, yeah how to create an amazing candidate experience, um, as well as just sort of bringing the expertise to any given role. So you know what you're they're likely to be able to find in the market in terms of candidate talent and skills and the salaries that go with that. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what we do. And in terms of how it differs from other with other industries, um, I think it's the the creativity really uh, within video games is is kind of the the major thing. Um, people have their their kind of passion projects, and sometimes not not always, but sometimes they will um, take a lower salary um, because they you know they they just love the project, or they might be offered the the best salary they could ever get and but still yeah not not really be interested in it because they're not the the project doesn't the spark. passion is not there yeah exactly so that's that's kind of what one of the main things and then i think as well studio culture is a is a big thing um for the for this industry that it has a higher percentage of people with neurodivergent um diagnoses than than other industries so more autism more adhd as an example so you know having an environment that's inclusive and welcoming of that it can be a big factor and i'd say uh, remote working is a big one um because it's an industry where you can and the opinion varies wildly on this topic and i'm sure that a lot of people would be happy to get into a debate about this um but in a lot of studios or some studios think that um certainly a lot of candidates think that the these jobs can be done remotely so that's that's a big factor that's often high on the the list of desirables for for candidates in, in this industry so i think that's those are the kinds of areas where it can differ on the whole a lot from from other industries well i love to have you in this, in this interview honestly because uh 2023 was a year of a lot of layoffs um it was something that it impacted the the industry in general so it was hard to see when you enter linkedin all these heartbreaking posts and everything uh, so having you here to give like this fresh perspective on how can we help, how can we make things easier for applicants. Um, so I wanted to ask like for individuals aspiring to join the video game industry, what advice or tips would you give them to stand out in their applications and interviews? And what are the key qualities or skills you look for when recruiting for positions in the video game industry? Yeah. 
is i mean this is where it can be very similar to other industries uh, you know any um sort of well-designed job should have a job description with the requirements for that role so um that's you know where we always we always kind of look at the job description we talk with the studio we find out what's the uh what it is that's you know required for any any given role um i think some of the the skills that maybe people don't always realize though or might ne not necessarily be um highlighted on the job description but ultimately will be the difference between success and failure are things like communication skills the soft skills um, you can know everything there is to know about game design or programming, but if you annoy everyone around you or you're <laughs> rude to everyone around you, you'll get nowhere very fast. Um, so, you know, it's, it's uh, making sure you can you can work with people and be a team player and communicate well and set boundaries and manage expectations. All those kinds of things are, are areas where, where people kind of need to... to keep an eye on or, or develop. So interesting what you just said, Emily, because uh, in previous interest in, pre in previous interviews, when we, you know, asked managers or from from studios and they say the same things, how much they value those soft skills. Uh, so now hearing from you as well, from the recruitment process, how do you usually like see those things or like, how, how can people like, present themselves with this? Uh, soft skills or how how is it part of the recruitment process that you can evaluate a person in those regards? Well, it, it varies a lot. Um, different studios will, will take different approaches to, to how they assess these things. Hopefully every studio will go through each point on their um, person specification and their job description and make sure that's covered at some point during the selection process. Um, but uh, it's about kind of being friendly and personable at interviews, listening, basic things like not interrupting people. I'm sure we're all guilty of it now and then by accident, but, you know, <laughs> apologizing if you do, that that sort of thing. Um, yeah, just basics uh, like that. And then it may be that the um, you'll have sort of a, an interview where you meet different members of the team. So thinking about how you tailor your approach to different team members. And really that again comes back often a, a lot to to listening, listening to what it is they're looking for and and responding in, in kind to, to that. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so any advice that you could give to professionals to how to prepare for a potential job uncertainties. I mean, Lali was talking about the layoffs or, you know, the bit of the, the deflation that 2023 had with the, with the working, with the jobs in, in the video game industry. So how can people prepare themselves for, for potential job uncertainties? Do you have any recommendations or any, I don't know, methods that people can prepare i think it it, it really varies um and not, yeah obviously as you've pointed out it has been a sadly a really unfortunate time let's let's hope this yeah. this year is a bit different and uh not at all like last year um yeah <laughs> i'm hopeful we'll we'll see um so yeah i think it's it depends on your goals obviously if you are um, someone who's just kind of recently got into the industry and you desperately want to stay into the in the industry and continue building out your experience there, you know, make sure you make a good good impression on those you're working with now. And it's your it's your existing network who can be a huge asset if you are then put in a position where you're no longer employed. Um, so yeah, just um being good to those around you making good impression um and kind of making sure you keep your um cv and your linkedin profile up to date you might want to um make notes as you go throughout the year just now and then on things you've achieved um whether you if you can write down any metrics or um even if it's not numbers things that happened as a result of the work that you've done 
um, that will that will make it much easier if you then have to suddenly write a CV or update your LinkedIn profile. Um, so kind of keeping a rolling record of that. It doesn't have to be a very great detail, but um, all of that stuff you you might thank yourself for if you find yourself in that position, you'd be, be a bit, bit less daunted. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, if you're someone, however, who maybe is at a later stage in their career um, or has a family um, and so can't really afford to kind of hold fast to the, the video games industry, no matter what happens, um, it's worth considering where else you, you might want to um, sort of spread your wings um yeah. the the you know the interactive industry is also um also an option as, as well as many others um so you, you you might want to move into that space where you know vr is being used for things like training in more corporate environments um those sorts of things those industries might not be struggling quite so much um right. so yeah you could you could kind of spread out and just because you you leave the industry it doesn't mean that you can never come back you're never going to lose that experience that you've already already got it's not going anywhere um that's that's yeah. true yeah you'll always be able to point back to it so don't don't be afraid to have a bit of a change you might even find it's, it's a nice welcome change and you, you learn a lot of new things good advice and I mean, I was, I was curious, do you think, uh, like, in your experience, have you seen, like, a, that's an important thing that uh, networking and building industry connections uh, for this type of challenges, uh, like, shop changes, and um, how important do you think that is? And if you have any advice on, like, effective networking strategies for people listening? Yeah, hundred percent. Networking is is a huge, huge factor. Um, whether you do that online, um, you know, via connecting with people on LinkedIn or uh, joining Discord communities or finding local um, groups, like there's sites like Eventbrite and Meetup where um, you know they have game dev communities potentially in your local area of of people who are meeting up to discuss different topics. Um, that and your your existing network can be a huge huge factor in in getting a job. Um, you know, I, I'd say, and this applies also to people who are looking to break into the industry. Um, you know, there are sort of hundreds of applicants um, for some of these jobs, particularly the entry level ones, um, and even some of the more senior ones. So it's it's about sort of thinking about how you will stand out from the crowd. Um, if a hiring manager has sort of five minutes, if that, to spend on your CV, how are they going to remember you? What What's going to make you stand out? If you've met them um, at an event or online, just sent a, a little message just to say, hi, uh, you know, I really like your studio. I love what you're doing. Um, those things can be a huge factor. And not only that, but talking about LinkedIn in particular, you... Um, your what you see in your newsfeed um, and who sees your newsfeed, your posts in, in their feed is affected by how close of a connection you are. Um, you've got your first degree and third connection, first, second and third degree connections and then people who are out of your network and you're not going to see posts from from people who aren't um, aren't within your your kind of network or your first degree connections. So um, interacting with people on there in that space will make their, your name popping up, will make their your name stick in their head a bit more. So when they see your CV, they're like, oh, I don't recognize that name. Um, but also it's the, yeah, it's the affecting their feed and, and making sure their news, their job posts and their updates are in your feed so you can be one of the first people to reach out. Um, they're kind of huge things. And kind of going back to your earlier question about, um, you know, how you can prepare for layoffs and redundancies or a couple of other things you can do, like um, sort of looking at job descriptions for um, your current role or roles you might be looking to move into if you find yourself in that situation um, and seeing if there are any common skills gaps that are coming up again and again. Um, you know, is there a particular code um, language or um, a particular bit of experience you don't have? 
um, that's coming up time and time again that you could potentially either do a little bit of training in online now or speak with your manager to see if they can help give you experience in that area. Um, those are also extra things you can, can do so you, if you hopefully you don't but if you do find yourself in that situation you feel a bit more confident. Thank you so much. That's like really interesting, honestly. Um, I know we've been talking about this. Uh, people is getting like these uncertainties in their everyday life. Um, so I was asking, can you recall like in a specific instance where an application stood up for you? Um, and what strategies can you or recommendations can you offer uh, to those that are looking um, to upgrade or get advancements within the industry? Yeah, um, so it really varies depending on the on the role. Um, that's, I think, why, you know, uh, recruitment agencies are often set up or, or at least our agency is set up with each consultant specialising in their own area, whether that's design and production, engineering, art and animation, etc. Um, because you, you kind of need that expertise for what's required for each different role. Um, so yeah, tailoring your CV, I kind of recommend reaching out um, to a recruiter um, to kind of get that bespoke and specific advice. Um, but I think the kind of basic clear principles um, are generally make sure um, it's nice and clear and well laid out and well spaced. Some people have incredible experience or are quite even quite senior and you and you look at their CV and you think, how have you, <laughs> how is your CV like this? It looks terrible. I'm sure there's lots of great experience that you've got, but this, I can't, this hurts my eyes. <laughs> it's something um, that you have to actively get done. That's why to come back to another one of your replies, LinkedIn upkeep and CV upkeep are things that you need to save some time on your calendar to get it done, right? Otherwise, you can be the most senior, most expert person in your role, but your CV is going to look the same as it was 10 years ago. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. So, yeah, it's things like making sure it's nice and cleanly spaced. It's got coherent formatting. It's not, like, got fluorescent colors and things like that. Color is fine as long as it's nice and readable um it's yeah uh, probably no more than two pages again it comes back to that point of a hiring manager getting hundreds of applications a day and um you know they've got a very small amount of time you can spend on on reading your cv so you don't want to bury the lead right at the end four pages deep um try and keep it concise right down to the highlights your achievements and, and things like that those are um really key and if you're in a creative role, such as, you know, an art role, make sure you link to your portfolio or your website. You know, those things are really key. Link to your LinkedIn um, so you can add more detail there. If there really are things that you think, oh, I just I really want to include this, but I, I can't fit it in the two pages. Think of your LinkedIn as an appendix to your, your CV or your resume. You can you can add stuff there and embellish. And make sure there are clear things like your location. Um, it doesn't need to include your kind of full address and stuff like that, or your date of birth, um, or your picture. Even you know, it's not it's not about trying to get your identity stolen. It's it's about making sure you've you've got the basic information that we need to know. Okay, where is this person located? Can they commute? Are they interested in commuting? Or are they only looking for? remote work and all those kinds of basic details um, are are really, really key. Um, and a little, don't forget the kind of paragraph um, at the top, as well as your experience, a little paragraph that's just an about you, what makes you tick, um, what, you know, what are you interested in, and kind of a couple of sentences, you know, summarising your experience overall. Um, again, brevity is key, um, but uh, it can can be a nice a nice easy way to kind of get a summary of of your experience and and you as a person i love that i love Great that. Advice. It's, it's to take notes right for everyone watching or listening everyone listening or, i was about to start reading. taking notes honestly i was like oh my god this is so interesting <laughs>
<laughs> this um, is really good advice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Um, now, I, I wanted to, to, to change the topic for a little bit because we're talking about video game industry, video game industry, video game industry. So I have a, a two-part question that is directed about video games. So I want to know what you've been playing recently that you just can't get enough of or that you would like to play. And if you have any game that you're really looking forward to in 2024. Oh, far too many things. Um, it's, it's <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> too many uncompleted at the moment. Um, oh God! Don't get me started on uncompleted games. Those, we, we, we don't we don't talk about those. They are still hunting me. Honestly, those. like they are like, there. Right? Yeah, they are looking at me right now. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Please like don't install it. it. I know. Find new games than the uncompleted games. Looking at you. Like. Yes, they're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hi. <laughs> and Every new game that comes in is like, oh, yeah, welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm actually yeah. like, stop, stop releasing games. It's too much. There's too many I want to play. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> It's funny, it's just like, actually, I did um, a little post today. I'm not affiliated with IGN in any way, I should say. But um, I, over the Christmas break, discovered that if you go to the IGN website and register, you can log your games that you're playing at the moment under like uh, playing or taking a break or on your backlog of games or once you've quit. And I was like, oh my God, I can actually remember what it is. I'm halfway so you through. Can, you can have like uh, in that information uploaded in, at the IGN website. Yeah, so you that? just go on, you create an account, yeah, and then you just search for the game. Um, so like I'm pay playing Pikmin 4 at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and then you just click on the game and you go, I think it's like add to library or something, and then you can put it under playing or on taking a break or quit. Um, it's really, really, really good. I was like, oh, I can finally not, not have all this information in my brain. I could just put it in this thing. <laughs> but that's an interesting way to also uh, have interaction on the website, right? That's smart. Way to go, IGN. Yeah, it's very smart, very clever. I wonder if they're if they're using the kind of data behind that for anything. Oh, that's sure. interesting. Being I'm sure. The, they, yeah, being yeah. the type of website that they are, I'm I'm saying it the best way possible, right? They are doing a great job at it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm playing Pikmin Four, um, Dredge. I'm still trying to finish uh, God of War Ragnarok um too too many things of oh, diablo 4 um i think yeah, I, yeah that's, of... that's never ending right now diablo 4 <laughs> yeah. with every season <laughs> it keeps getting better yeah. that's the good news <laughs> i know there's a main campaign i still haven't finished and beyond that i yeah i've heard some things but <laughs> no but the main campaign alone it's worth it so take your time yeah yeah <laughs> and is there a game that you're looking for in 2024 that it's just like a first day of pre pre purchase. Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head, but there's still games from 2023 that I haven't even started, like um, Zelda's Tears of the Kingdom, um, and uh, I want to play Expanse <laughs> Telltale uh, game. Um, so yeah, there's. I'm sure there will be more coming up that I'm just like no. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. That's the only thing I'm going to say because Tears of the Kingdom for me was, I mean, I got this huge tattoo of the dragon, so it Amazing. was. Amazing. Yeah. It must have made an impact. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, no one asked, but for me, I want to I wanna say it anyways. For me personally, I'm waiting for <laughs> the next Final Fantasy VII remake game. Um, that's coming out in February and Silent okay. Hill 2 remake. I want to get scared again. <laughs> I, 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 I missed. Thank you, Konami. Thank you for hearing my years and years of asking for another Silent Hill game. <laughs> uh, so everyone, Emily, thank you so much for being a part of cool. Open World. Thank you so much for Every input, every advice. Thank you, Lali, 
Melly for being a part of this show all throughout the year and this bit of 2024. And to you on the other side of the screen of the or headpiece, or if you're reading on the other side of the screen, thank you so much. We'll be seeing you next time in another episode of Open World. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.